All right, everyone, it looks like we've got quite a few people joining in now. And so I will go ahead and get us rolling. Good morning, I'm Heather Cummins. I'm the Gallery Programs Coordinator at the Bell Museum. And I just wanna thank everyone for being with us this morning. We're so excited to host the program Bugtastic Arthropod Bodies and How They Work uh, with the Bug Chicks. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, Farm and Food Alliance of Minnesota and MGK for their generous support, bringing this virtual program to everyone today. Today, we're gonna to take a deep dive into insect bodies and how they work. And I'd like to take a moment as we begin our exploration to acknowledge that the Bell Museum sits on the traditional and treaty land of the Dakota people who lived here before European settlers. The Dakota people have a great amount of knowledge about the many important ways of knowing the land that we now call Minnesota. And at the Bell, we honor and support that knowledge, the values embedded in it, and the people who keep it. Our program this morning supports our current temporary exhibit, Bugs Outside the Box, which displays larger than life insect sculptures, each showcasing the beauty hidden within these mini beasts of the natural world. Through this exhibit, we would like to invite our audiences to get inspired and get outside, use your observation skills and learn about the insects you can find on our learning landscape at the museum and in your own neighborhoods. There are activities developed in collaboration with researchers at the university, including students, as well as community groups to help guide you in your insect observations with a focus on Minnesota species. We also have a number of upcoming virtual events to look forward to. Our guests this morning are Christy Reddick and Jessica Honecker, who together are the Bug Chicks. They are entomologists and educators who teach about the incredible world of insects, spiders, and their relatives. Before I turn it over to the Bug Chicks, I have a few notes for our audience. We're going to hold some time at the end today for questions for Jessica and Christy. So please post those in the chat as we're going. Uh, any comments are welcome as well, and we'll get to those at the end of our program. As you've noticed, we have closed captioning turned on for our program this morning. If you don't want to see these captions, you can hide them by clicking on the live CC button at the bottom of your screen. And a very warm welcome and thank you to Jane, our captioner today. Christy and Jessica, thank you so much for being with us this morning. With that, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank awesome. you, Heather. Thanks, Heather. Oh, we are so excited oh, yes. to be here. We have got an awesome program for y'all today. Yeah, we, uh, behind the scenes, we've got, <laughs> there's a lot going on. There's a lot of specimens. There's a lot of live animals and some special things that we're going to teach you with. So Bugs Outside the Box is, if you haven't been there yet, please, please make sure that you visit the Bell to see this mm -hmm. incredible exhibit. We've seen it in person and oh my goodness. It's, it's mind blowing. And you'll get to see all of the little teeny tiny pieces of insects and other arthropods that you don't really think about. And you don't really get to see when you just see them outside in nature. So definitely right. go. Because when a bee or a dragonfly is zooming past you, you can't see the ankle bone. And when you go to Bugs Outside the Box, you get to see the tarsi, the ankle bones, I'm gonna use that term lightly, of these animals. And to me, I wanna see all the bits and pieces. I wanna know what they do. I wanna know how they function together. And so that's why we built our program today, all about arthropod body parts. Mm -hmm. So here's how we're gonna do this today. We're gonna to start with a little bit of an introduction on who we are and the, the amazing animals that we study. And then we're going to just bring everyone up to speed about this term bug versus arthropod because it can get a little bit confusing. And then we're going to dive right into doing sort of a roadmap of animals. We're going to start at the head of animals and move through the bodies with some of these incredible functions and structures and and at the end, we have a little special surprise for you. And then we're gonna do <laughs> we're gonna do some questions at the end, like like Heather said. Okay, so first things first. My name's Christy. Yep. My name is Jess. And we are the Bug Chicks. We are entomologists, like Heather said. Um, and in fact, Heather was in one of my very first classes that I taught, and now she's at the bell, and I just every time I see her, I just oh, just want to squeeze her. So um, so I study for for my 
the animal that I focus on as an entomologist is something a little bit weird, but super misunderstood as well. Super misunderstood. I, I love to focus on, especially predators that are, that are very, very misunderstood. This is something that I'm really interested in. And I sort of focus on arachnids. So without further ado, let's just show you my animal because you really need to see what I am talking about. Yep. So I'm going to share my screen here and I think you can see this incredible sort of trio of pictures. Now these are called camel spiders, also known as solifuge arachnids. They have lots of different names, wind scorpions, sun mm -hmm. spiders. They are not true scorpions. No. They are not true spiders. They mm -hmm. are not true camels. Let's just get it all on the table. <laughs> these are arachnids. Let's count the legs really quickly. I know you're at home and I can't see that you're counting, but I'll know if you're counting along. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. When I first saw this creature, I thought it had 10 legs. These, when I was like early, I, I wasn't really an entomologist yet. I didn't really know what I was looking at. But I came to find out that these are mouth parts. These are leg-like mouth parts called pedipalps. In this animal, they are leg-like pedipalps. Now, Jessica is going to be writing some words for us because she has very neat handwriting. I think we're always going to use the proper term with you, okay? Pedipalps. Pedipalps. Pedipalps are like mouth hands. They help bring food to the mouth. Here is the chalicery, and we'll write that later in a second. Chalicery, these are the jaws of these animals. So basically, at the ends of these pedipalps, they have like little suction cups. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing so you can see what I'm about to do because it's drama. So <laughs> you have these long leg-like mouth parts. At the ends, for solifuges, they have these like little suction cups, right? They're called suctorial organs. Right? It's a good one. <laughs> it's a real good one. The words, not just the, not just the structures and functions, but the words. Oh, it's our fave. So they run around the desert real fast like this. And when they run into something that they might want to eat as prey, because they're predators, they use those suctorial organs to grab onto something, say like a beetle or a cricket, and they drag it into those chalicery, which are those jaws. And basically in these Camel spiders in these solifuges, they're like two lobster claws that attach to the front of their face because these animals do not have venom. They are arachnids, but they do not have venom. They don't need the venom. Their jaws are so powerful at crushing that they can just crush their prey. And they crush their prey like this. And then they have a third mouth part, which remember this term, rostrum. It's like a sucking, it's like a vacuum cleaner hose covered in fur. And basically it <laughs> like slurps up the crushed bug juice. So these are the animals that I study. I studied them in Kenya and East Africa. I got to name and describe a new species. The one that I pointed to that, that we counted, that's the species that I got to name. Now notice that I did not say that I discovered it. There are millions and millions of people for tens of thousands of years who have lived in East Africa. I am not the first person to have seen that animal. It was not discovered by her. I didn't discover it. I just found an animal that did not have a name for science yet. Like science hadn't really named it and classified it yet. So that's what I did. And here's a tip. If you grow up, if some of you are major bug dorks and you think that maybe one day you would like to name and describe a species of anything or, or a bacteria or whatever, here's a tip. Never, never, never name something after yourself. It's bad manners. Name it after someone you truly admire or describe the animal in some way. But if you name it after someone, name it after someone you truly admire, like, like a teacher or a parent or a bug chick, you can name it after else. I'm just saying. We won't be mad. We, that is <laughs> nice. So I named it after my research partner and great friend, Joseph Mugambi. So I named that animal Terabulida. That's the genus name that it fit with. And then I got to pick the second name, Mugambii. Terabulida Mugambii in, um, in honor of my great friend and colleague, Joseph Mugambi, who is an incredible entomologist yeah. in his own right. Um, he, he loved butterflies and moths. So that's what I do for my research. I went to Kenya. I drove around the country in a truck I bought on a credit card, which I don't recommend, and uh, studied these amazing creatures. And it was the time of my life. And I loved it. And I brought Jess along for part of it. And yeah. It was cool. It was fantastic. Now, Jessica's also an entomologist, but she does something totally 
different. Yep. So uh, I am an agricultural entomologist and my specialty is this little insect. Um, and that is uh, a black margined aphid. And aphids might be familiar to some of you, especially if, got, if you have um, gardens. Um, these are considered to be a big pest of um, gardens and of farming sort of systems. And I looked at them in pecan agro ecosystems because they feed on the undersides of leaves. They have a rostrum, just like Christie's camel spider, but it functions in a different way. It looks a little bit like, um, like a straw and it comes off of the end of their face and they jam it into leaves and they drink out the phloem from those leaves. And that phloem carries nutrients, it carries energy, it carries sugars for, for that, that plant to sort of grow and flourish. And if the aphids drinking all that out, then the plant's not gonna have it for its own growth. And it's gonna be focused more on survival than it is on like producing fruits and nuts and things like that for us to eat. And so my work was all about figuring out what kind of damage they actually did, um, not just to the tree, but to the farmers as well. So I went around and I collected um, aphid honeydew, which is the science word for aphid pea. She is an aphid peaologist. It's true. And you would think that you would think that it's sweet because it's called honeydew and it's like made of sugars and right. stuff. It's not sweet. Not all sugars are sweet. We tasted it. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. You don't have to. We did that for you. Mm -hmm. That's our job. It's true. That's our burden. That's our burden. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, basically, um, through my work, I was able to, to figure out that aphids weren't causing as much damage to the trees that farmers thought they were. And so they were able to cut back on spraying pesticides, which saved them a lot of money. And then there's not as many chemicals in the environment, which is good for the bugs. It's good for the trees and it's good for us, too. So people, that's what we do as entomologists. As the bug chicks, we travel all over the world and we teach people about amazing bugs. We teach about morphology, which is the study of the structure and the function of body parts, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I think we wanna dive right into it. I think that's a great idea. I wanna do it. So we are gonna start by talking about basically looking at the whole organism. Because mm -hmm. when you go to the exhibit, when you go to the bell and you see bugs outside the box, you are seeing those tiny, tiny little animals blown up into mm -hmm. a huge size. Yeah. The artist and who did it did an incredible job. Yeah, and you may not know sort of where to look first, right? Because these animals are so intricate. And so in order to sort of like give you a roadmap of some of these things, we're gonna just start at the top yes. and work our way down piece by piece to, to talk about some of the really cool aspects of bug morphology. So we're gonna go by body section. We're gonna teach you a word mm -hmm. right now, tagma or tagmata. Jessica, can you run? I'm on it. One? Tagma or tagmata, the, this is uh, the body sections. So head, thorax, abdomen, right? That's for insects, head, thorax, mm -hmm. abdomen. However, other arthropods like arachnids have different tagmata. They have, uh, so like arachnids have a cephalothorax, which is basically the head and the thorax mushed together. Mm -hmm. And then they have an abdomen or an opisthosoma. I yeah. know I'm using a lot of big words. We're going to give you a glossary of yep. terms that you can download so that you can like read the dictionary of bugs so that you'll be able to like reference it back mm -hmm. because I know a lot of you are super bug dorks. Yeah. Now, speaking of this word bug, and we're throwing it around with bug and arthropod yes. and insect and arachnid, Let's talk but about like what is a bug, right? Chris, do you want to give me an example? Okay. Bug? So when most people who are not entomologists talk about bug, they talk about bug, they use the word bug mm -hmm. in a couple different ways. They either talk about like a creepy crawly, creepy crawlies, or they say, stop bugging me. Ooh. Or look at a stomach bug. I a feel sick. Stomach bug. Now, does a stomach bug have legs? No. Um, if you're bugging someone, is that about an animal? No, though sometimes bugs bug you, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. So bug is basically something that we describe creepy crawlies with, or something else that is irritating to us. Right. Um, but I think the word that people want to use, but they just don't know it, is the word arthropod. Arthropod. Oh, write that down. An arthropod is any animal with six or more jointed legs. Everybody, move your joints. Okay. It's just where like sections that meet, they move, and they have an exoskeleton. So we are going to be talking about arthropods today. We should be called the arthropod chicks, but no one will know what we're talking about. So we use the word bug and then we teach people the right word. Yes, you with us? I want to look at some 
arthropods. Let's do it. We're going to start at the head, people. Yep. We're starting at the head, and here's what we are starting with. Well, actually, oh, wait, we have one thing. We, we have, have to set up an experiment. We yes. have to set up an experiment. Here is a moisture chamber. Basically, it's just a wet paper towel in a zip bag. bag. Let's go over to the Celestron yep. microscope cam, and we're going to show you this. It's a kind of flower beetle. Okay, and I want you to look at the color contrast of the exoskeleton on this flower beetle. So you see yellow and you see dark brownish black, mm -hmm. right? And can you scroll it over a little bit so we can see the, more of the animal? There we go. So we can see that this is the color of the exoskeleton. This animal does something very interesting in humidity. We're going to do a little experiment, remind us. So at yep. the end, we're going to open this bag back up. We're going to put it in this wet paper towel in our humidity chamber. The bug chicks are all about doing <laughs> things that are easy for you to do at home. We're not going to use any complicated stuff today because besides our microscope, because, because we really believe that science can be done anywhere and with any tools yeah and because, also because discovery and fun yeah because science is everywhere it's yeah. not just in a lab it's not just out doing field work science is in our homes so yes. by using the things we find here it's a good hopefully a good inspiration for you guys science is inquiry science mm -hmm. is asking questions after making observations i'm wrapping it up gently and i'm putting it in the humidity chamber. We'll get back to this later in the show. Oh, I'm so excited. Okay. Okay. Um, now we're going to start with the head. Yeah. Here we go. Are we ready, Jess? We are. Okay. So what are we starting with? We can start off mm. with a bang. Okay. We have uh, a Just... Honduran curly haired tarantula. We're going to start the show with Beyonce. Nobody starts a show with Beyonce. That's true. We're, we're game changers. Here we go. That's, that, that, that's, that's also true. <laughs> So what we're going to do is we're going to start with some mouth parts um, and spiders have fangs, right? What we call fangs. And um, Christy is going to take Beyonce, uh, who is our curly hair tarantula. Can you see her yep, yep. down in the I'm corner? Move it, I'm move it. There now she look. is. There she is. She has got really curly hairs and her fangs mm -hmm. are underneath her, her, her head space. Yeah. They kind of mm -hmm. sit this way. Most of the time when I, here, I'm, gonna move I'm like literally not even on my, hold on. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited. Most of the time when people hold a tarantula and most of the time, honestly, when I hold Beyonce, I will pick her up by tapping her legs and she'll move onto my hands. Mm -hmm. However, I'm going to do something different this time. I am going to use what's called a cupping technique mm -hmm. and we can actually film this we can actually yeah and i'm gonna and i'm gonna throw out a caveat too um for those of you who are watching who are not entomologists who aren't like super into spiders and bugs and stuff don't just go out and grab spiders that you see um they do have venom um and you never know how you're going to react if you're bitten and if you can't interpret their body language best to just look i'm going to take my hand like this and i'm going to go over her gently and then I'm going to cup her in my hand and pick her up upside down like this. So now she is sitting upside down in my hand. She's a little bit covered in <laughs> dirt and stuff. And we can see now her fangs. Now we're going to put her underneath the microscope to show you her fangs because this is fascinating. All right, here we go. When you look at the fangs, you notice, first of all, that they are very shiny. And I'm mm -hmm. actually gonna go even a little bit down so we can see them, yeah. see them in their entirety. There so we, we notice that they are shiny. That's because uh, the calissery, the fangs mm -hmm. of a spider, of a tarantula, tarantulas are kinds of spiders, with, they can't see the microscope. Why can't they see it? Uh, Jess and Christy, what if you turn off your person video? Okay. Hold on one second, people. Troubleshooting on the fly. Right, I'm going to turn off our video for a second. Can you see the Can microscope you see it now? now? Looks now over. they see both. Good. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. Thanks for the heads now, up. Guys. Thank you, people. Yeah. Thank you. We appreciate that. Can you hear us still? 
Yes. Excellent. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. Thank you. If you okay. want to put yours in a grid view, that might help. It might be that some of you have speaker view. And as we're speaking mm. and showing a video, that might be the issue. Yeah. Okay, people. Now we can see that Beyonce's fangs are shiny. Her fangs are covered in a very, very hard exoskeleton. Her entire body is covered in exoskeleton, but her fangs are what we call sclerotized. Fangs need to be a little bit harder and sharper mm -hmm. than the rest of the exoskeleton because they have to pierce. That's the yep. function of a fang. Yep. And can you show the, um, there are teeny tiny little holes at the, at the tips of those fangs and that's where venom is injected into the prey animal. And honestly, with her, because her fangs are embedded in mm. her mouth right now, they're yeah, pretty curled they're up, in. I'm going to go grab an exoskeleton, an exuvia, yeah. so that we can see the holes in the fangs. Yeah, I love it. Hold on one second. I'm saying yep, goodbye to Beyonce. Bye, girl. So sweet. We'll see her a little bit later, too. Yes. And so, um, so there are tiny little holes at the tips of these um, fangs and the venom is injected and uh, there's sort of uh, this misconception that spiders also kind of suck up through their fangs and that's not the case. Um, they have a teeny tiny little mouth part underneath those fangs that they use to sort of like suck up um, the bug juice because the, the venom functions to dissolve the prey animal. I know that you can only see the microscope right now and that is Oh, yeah. Can you see the, at the very, very tip, those little beveled holes? There's little teeny beveled holes right at the tip. Yeah. And then the mouth itself, where they actually eat from, is down in that sort of darker space the behind mouth the fangs. itself, and let me, as I move, she's a quite a big tarantula. As I move, you can see. So I'm kind of pointing oh, yeah, right yeah. now to the mouth. You can kind of see it see down that? underneath. Underneath the fangs. Okay, so fangs. So this is that exuvia that I was holding. Mm -hmm. This is that exuvia. So when, when an arthropod molts, when they pull out of their old exoskeleton, they leave behind an exuvia. Tarantulas leave behind really beautiful exuvia. Oh, yeah. Um, other other like some insects will eat the old exoskeleton mm -hmm. in order to like leave no trace of where they were, right? And um, a lot of tarantula keepers will take the exuvia out so that we can show. Yeah, like check out the chambers in that cephalothorax. They pull each and every one of their legs out of those little holes. So, so I was just showing you those things. She molts those fangs. When you see a tarantula molt, if you ever get that opportunity, they're white after they just mm -hmm. molted. That means that they're pretty soft. And then yep. as they darken, as they harden, they darken. Yep. That is kind of how that works with exoskeleton. Yep. And that's that process of sclerotization. Yes. Okay. Excellent. So right. that's a mouth part that that we're pretty familiar with 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 spiders yep but we want to go to some other mouth parts a little now. bit more familiar now can i have a lid yes you so need that, a lid so, so the beyonce, beyonce can go back to her dressing room awesome yeah. that thank you and then i'm gonna grab squishy pete because i think we really need to do some caterpillar mouth parts and i know everyone's like caterpillar blah 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 but the mouth parts on these are pretty exceptional Mm -hmm. So this is a hornworm caterpillar, pretty big one. Yep. All right. And we're going to try this again with the microscope. And, you, and I'm sure that you all will let us know how it's yeah. working. Okay. So I'm going to put You can even yeah. see. Now, this is a great example of chewing mouth parts. Yep, and, and the mouth parts that you're looking at are those really dark, almost black, sort of jagged, two-part yes. two grinders. 
So basically, one of the things that we want you to start thinking about, especially after you see the exhibit at the Bell, mm -hmm. is as you are walking around for the rest of the summer, you will be seeing insects and other arthropods. And what I want you to think about is, even if you don't know something about the animal that you are seeing, you can look at its body parts and try to make a guess or a hypothesis, mm -hmm. if you will, about what that animal might eat based on its mouth parts. Mouth parts tell you a lot. So these mouth parts don't suck, they chew. And you can really see that in the way that they move. Oh, he's squishing, oh, squishy pee. <laughs> You can really see that in the way that those mouth parts move. Oh, you can see the tongue. That is my favorite part. Look at That's that. That's great. That is incredible. Are you all seeing this? I hope that you're seeing Squishy Pete. Okay. All right. Excellent. I'm sure that yeah. someone would tell us. If yes. They can. All right, so we are seeing those mouth parts. Now look at the top lip there, the little sort of like lobed white top yeah. lip, and I'm not hurting him, he's just squirming a little bit. Um, <laughs> That's the thing about, about having live animals under a microscope, right. is they're a little bit squirming. They do squirm a bit. So that top lip can move up and down, and they, it's, like, it's like a layer cake almost of mouth parts. There's so <laughs> many different things going on and the little things that look like antennae coming off the mouth that are kind of pulsing a little bit right now. Here, I'll put him against my hand. That are pulsing. Oh, 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 you can really see that. Did you see oh, that? Oh, that was amazing. Oh, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter how many times we've seen it. Really, I know. Really still thrilled. Okay, so that is, those are those chewing mouth parts. We can see from the way that they are chewing, we're like, okay, that animal chews mm -hmm. something else. That animal is eating something yep. else. And of course we all know that caterpillars for the most part are eating leaves. Yep. They are voracious. I mean, they just, they cannot stop eating. They're, they're little eating machines, yes. right? Okay. Now, sometimes we can get to an animal that has mouth parts that are pretty tricky. And did you know that some adult moths even, mm -hmm. like Squishy Pete is gonna grow up to be a moth with a long curly straw mouth part. It's a hummingbird moth. Yep. But there are other moths that grow up and their mouth parts don't function or they're what we call vestigial mouth parts where they have reduced. They're super reduced and small. And they don't function at all because some moths emerge from their pupa and their sole purpose is to mate, lay eggs, and then die. And yep. so they don't need to eat yep. as adults. And they have a kind of a short lifespan too. Um, we've got a really good example of one that doesn't have uh, functioning mouth parts. So these big, beautiful, oh, bye Micah. Yeah, I hope that you enjoy going to the bell. We're so excited. Okay, so these big, beautiful moths, I'm going to put this underneath yeah. the skirt, and you're going to see there's no mouth parts to be seen. It's got a little bit of dust on it. There's the eye. So there's the eye. There's no mouth parts, or they're very reduced mm -hmm. underneath all of that moth, moth fuzz, the moth scales, <laughs> and the moth fuzz, right? So normally on like a hummingbird moth, mm -hmm. this would be a big curly straw, but on this animal, there are no functioning mouth parts. We're gonna see this one again in just a second. Yep. And Jessica, we need to hurry. You, oh my gosh, we I do. know. Okay, oh my God, there's so many things to show you. We could do this for like five hours. Okay, so buckle up. <laughs> buckle up, okay. Now, I, okay. I think we need to talk about cicadas. Yes, because Sakaya, so we're in Ohio right now. And so we are sort of in the epicenter of the, the brood X, the brood 10 um, periodical cicada emergence. And there's a lot of misinforma misinformation about these animals because they're not great flyers. They're kind of like big bodied and their wings are kind of, you know, fluttery, fluttery and, and they're clumsy flyers and they've got a long mouth part called a rostrum that um, people think, oh, it's going to bite me. They're going to stick that in me, but they really just drink like plants out. 
Um, so again, when you see an animal's mouth parts, mm -hmm. you can determine what it eats, right? Yep. And we've talked a little bit about rostrums already, yep. sucking up liquid. Everybody knows what a rostrum is. Basically, it's a straw. And yes, that's Mountain Dew. And I apologize. And I haven't had Mountain Dew in like 20 years and I'm going to do it. Okay. So basically, I'm ready for the sugar rush. <laughs> the, the interesting thing about the rostrum, mm -hmm. I think, for a cicada is that it lies in between the leg joints. Mm -hmm. It goes all the way down yeah. the thorax, almost to the abdomen, and then mm -hmm. can come out like yep. this. And they can do, watch. It's actually really impressive, dude. <laughs> Oh, Mountain Dew. That's intense. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So it basically, it basically functions as an attached straw. It's a piercing, sucking mouth part. And you can tell that that's what it does by the way that it looks. Now, other animals that we know very well, we're, we're starting to get into props, people, because Jessica and I love to use common household items mm -hmm. to teach people about the function of different bug body parts. So here we have a clean. Clean <clears throat> and brand new. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> oh, let me do that one. Let me do that one more time. So here we have a clean <laughs> and brand new toilet bowl brush. Everybody knows what a toilet bowl brush is. Normal people see toilet bowl brush. Bug chicks see. Bug chicks see bee mouth parts. <laughs> yes, honey bee mouth parts. Honey bees have a hairy, sticky tongue mm -hmm. that helps them really maximize their time at a flower to slurp up yeah. nectar. So there's the nectar. <laughs> there's the nectar. Get in yep. there. Yep, it goes in, and then that nectar, um, kind of like s by static, attaches to can, all of the little yep. prickly bits of that tongue. It can really stick. And now, this was a pretty short flower, mm -hmm. right? But if you have a longer way to go to get to the nectar, that hairy, sticky tongue really helps mm -hmm. to grip. I got all of it. That's impressive. I feel very happy right now. Like that worked. It didn't work as well in rehearsal. <laughs> okay. So hairy, sticky tongue. It's called a glossa. All right. Can you write that? I down? can. Okay. So people, these are mouth parts. The other thing that is on the head of arthropods, obviously, most arthropods have antennae. Mm -hmm. But did you know, and I'm going to show you this animal. Where's my... Where's my, yes. we know that insects have one pair of antennae, centipedes, millipedes have one pair of antennae. Arachnids oh. have no antennae. Arachnids do not have antennae. However, crustaceans, crabs, shrimps, lobsters, crayfish, um, amphipods, yeah, all sorts of crustaceans. And isopods, which are also called roly polies or uh, sow bugs or pill bugs, have two pairs of antennae. We're gonna put one of these little dudes underneath the microscope. And actually, we're gonna put them under here so that you can see. Hold on, I have so many things going on. Okay. I'm gonna let it. Kind of unfurl. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. Oh, oh. So that first okay. pair is super obvious. Very obvious first pair of antennae. It's a bit rolled up in my hands right now. I'm going to let it unfurl. Unfurl. Here it goes. And we're going to try and find the second little pair of antennae. Can we see it? Sometimes they're so tiny. Oh, oh look. You can kind of see it. Look no, I think it's that. too small for even me to point out with a pen. Oh, but look at the, look at the amazingness of this animal. Oh, they are so cool. You can see the eyes, you can see those sclerites, which is like the, 
oh buddy you can see the different the, little plates the of armor. different little plates of armor so cool right so so crustaceans have two pairs of antennae and one is usually shorter than the other we're pretty used to seeing the long ones but sometimes you really have to look to see them oh this guy's all wrapped up in a little bit of dirt there absolutely so so the next time you look at a crab or a lobster, take a close look at their antennae and you can see that second pair kind of usually right by the first pair. Now, and actually coming back, just a little, Ooh, just a little a vocabulary little bit. So, English speakers, we want to say antennas, right? Because adding an S at the end makes it makes it plural. But um, for things like uh, body parts for morphology, we tend to we tend to go with the Latin, and so we add an A E at the end. So it's actually antennae. That's two. Antenna. And antenna <laughs> is one. Yep. All right. Exactly. And bringing back this moth, we've got. We saw this beautiful moth before, but maybe you didn't catch the antennae. Look at that. Male moths have these feathery antennae and they use these feathery antennae to smell the pheromones of females. Now, I like to think of pheromones like little bubbles of scent, mm -hmm. little bubbles of uh, smell, smelly stuff, yeah. right? And so what they're gonna use is they're gonna use their antennae to receive those bubbles of scent. And some male moths can find a female from one bubble of scent in a million molecules of other air from like seven miles away. Yeah, and look, like, look at those antennae. There, that's a lot of surface, surface area. Yes. And so the bigger the antennae, the more, um, the more space it has to, to touch these, these pheromone molecules. Uh, and then once we get even closer, sort of like once I can zoom in, each little feather has its own little hairs. Yeah. So think about feathers, then hairs on the feathers, then hairs on those hairs, then receptor sites. I yeah. mean, it is amazing. It is really, really cool. And one of the ways that we like to teach about that, to kind of visualize it a little bit, Basically, we're going to give you sort of a crash course in how do we make our own bug costumes mm -hmm. but using the things you find around your house, but functional, yeah. right? Functional bug costumes, right? So Jessica's going to be the female. I'm going to be the male. I got right. my little feather antennae. I've got oh, this is being broadcast at, like at the museum. Right now. It is. Get ready for it. I have to open this my jar of sense. pheromone. So I'm just hanging out. I'm just hanging out. Good luck. I'm out, I'm out of practice. If you get it in my eye. Oh, 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 yes. Now look, I, th they don't chase it. So it has to hit, <laughs> Jessica, it has to hit the antennae. We don't chase it. We're just using these as receptors. I'm going to move up so that it's easier. Oh, oh, good. Oh, I got oh, it. Oh, enough, 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 enough. <laughs> Okay, but you get the idea, right? So if you're like, I want to be a moth for Halloween, choose feathery antennae if you want to be a male moth yep. and more um, elongate antennae that aren't as feathery if you want to be a female moth. Yes, so that is how we use that. Now, I think we need to move on to the thorax because the thorax yes. is a big deal. The thorax is a big deal. Because the thorax on insects, and this is, this is huge, the thorax on insects, wings and legs always, always, always come from the thorax. Yep. In insects, wings and legs always, always, always come from the thorax. Sometimes you look at a beetle and it looks like the legs are coming from an abdomen. And actually- Especially if you're looking at it from the top. Yes. But, but that's not the case. Let's do this beautiful green one. Ooh, yeah. yeah. People would like to see this. So 
with this beautiful, stunning green flower beetle. And when you look at it from the top, you're like, okay, the legs kind of come from like all over the body, right? Yeah, because like, you can you can see the head up here, then then it's like, oh, well, this must be the thorax. And oh, I guess this is the abdomen. And it looks on the edges, like where you can see the legs that it comes out from sort of the lower section. But when we put it upside down underneath the microscope, we are able right. to see. Yeah, so here's the head. And I'm going to bring it yep. down again. I like it. Nice. Here's the head. Okay. So the head is right here. And then it goes into the thorax. One, two, three. And then, then you can see the abdominal plates, right? The abdominal exoskeleton in those little segments. Mm -hmm. But the legs always, always, always come from the thorax. And if we flip it over, we know that beetle elytra are the wings, kind of like a hard candy shell, right? Yep. Beetles are like M&Ms with legs. So this is the elytra here, this part, those that, hard forewings. That also originates from the thorax. Mm -hmm. Now, here's another thing we want to talk about really quickly. Um, do, 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 do. Ooh, specialized legs. We have an animal. We have a very special animal. Oh my gosh. I got to go get it. Hold on. I'll be right back. <laughs> so the animal that we're going to show you is um, a giant burrowing roach uh, from Australia. And these animals are really amazing. When you find them in nature, they can burrow down like a meter. They're one of the heaviest cockroaches in the world. And we have a pair. What I want you to focus on right now is the structure of the legs, which tells us by the way that it looks, what they do. Because yeah. some legs, like a praying mantis, they have the front legs that grab, right? They're raptorial. Or you have like a diving beetle with swimming legs, mm -hmm. but then you have burrowing insects like mole crickets and these yeah. burning cockroaches that have like almost like shovel yeah. shaped legs. Um, I think they might be on that side. They burrow, so they burrow, on. so we gotta find them. Where where are they? Oh, maybe. Oh, oh, there's one. Ooh. Oh, they're so big. They're too. there. And they're so like scrambly, scratchy because look, look, look at how the, big it is. Look. Oh, she's, and these she legs. Is beautiful. These legs. Here, take the, take the, yep. got it. We need a bigger studio. Okay. So people, we're going to show this underneath the microscope. Okay. Ready? Here we go. You can see, oh, look how, look how thickened they are. Really thick tibia. Mm -hmm. And then remember earlier I was talking about ankle bones and I called them tarsi. You can see the tarsal claws at the yep. tip. You can see so that's the little right segments here of the little tarsi, which is sort of like the, the bug term for, for, um, for, for like ankle bones or foot bones. And then you've got six really beefy, spiky tibia. Yeah. And I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna turn this yes. over Let's and take a look at the front over. legs. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Let's look at her. In, I'll, I'll focus She's it. Scrambly. They have powerful powerful legs. You can see how she's moving the legs even underneath the microscope. Look at this. As she, she's trying, she's to, trying burrow to burrow into Jessica's hands. You can see that. Look at her femurs. She has better, she has better muscles than yeah, I do, 100%. Right? Those femurs are pushing, shoving at Jessica. I'm going to move your and hand, She's Jess. really strong, she's too. She's very strong. You can see that flexible. Did you see that whitish? Yeah. Right in there, right there, right there. That whitish section right in here in between her... Um, what we would call like shoulder joints, which are, which are called coxy that then go into the femur. 
that is intersegmental membrane. It's very flexible. And what she's doing is she's using her muscles and she's, look at her little bicep. She's really scrambling and pushing with those muscles. You would be amazed the musculature of insects. Inside their that. exoskeleton, they really do have muscles that push and pull their bodies in order to function properly in their environments. It is amazing. I love these roaches yeah, so much. They're, they're, so they're wonderful. This big scrambly. It's, it is literally as long as Christie's fingers. And it is heavy. It's a heavy, heavy insect. They are fascinating creatures. Oh, okay. All right. All right. You want to scramble back underneath the dirt. Go for it, sweetie. Best of luck to you. Okay, now, people, we have oh, a little bit of time left. Like, yeah. I think we need to talk about, we need to skip to the abdomen. Yep. And we need to talk about the special sound producing organs mm. on cicadas. Yes. So here's what we're going to, I know this looks weird. It's here for a purpose. I'm going to teach you something. Let's look first at the photo. I think that's a good idea. Right? Let's look first at the photo. So I'm going to show you the photo of this cicada. And we're going to point out with our cursor here, the you, structure. Yeah. So do right you here. see, it's kind of, it's kind of really pale against, against the dark of the exoskeleton right here. Yeah. And you can kind of see that it has ridges, right? Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of people think that they are buzzing with their wings or they're buzzing with yeah. um, air or they're buzzing like hissing like a hissing cock. Yeah, like stridulation, like they're rubbing parts together. Right. Um, it's not exactly how that works. This, I like to think of a timble, like a Ruffles potato chip right here on their little abdomen, right? Right after their thorax, they've got these little timbles, the okay. males, okay? And the males are the ones that make noise. So basically it's like a Ruffles potato chip, but it can collapse and expand and collapse and expand. And I've been like racking my brain. How can I show how this works? And I can show it using a pop tube. This is a pop tube. It expands and then it collapses. It is possibly the least annoying thing on the planet. It is the greatest thing I've ever had. Let me show you under the microscope very clearly how that works, okay? So you have this pop tube and basically they take that timble and they have muscles that pull them together and take it apart to make that noise. Now they yep. do it super rapidly. They do uh, something like 300 to 400 times. Like, you know, they're like, and it's like, that's what makes that amazing. incredible noise. And then of course they have an air chamber inside that helps to amplify the yeah. noise kind of like a speaker. Yeah, like a speaker. Like a speaker. So basically that is how these insects make these noise. And it's so interesting that we have been teaching about cicadas now for a full month because we're at the end now of the cicada mm -hmm. emergence. They're all, they're all pretty much gone, they're done. But there are so many misconceptions about how the cicadas work and, yeah. and really what their function is mm -hmm. and, and things like that. So um, did you wanna show the, the specimen? Ooh, yeah, this one. No, 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 the, um, oh, you can show this. Well, you can show this. Show that. Well, just just so we don't just so we don't forget. So we don't forget. Yeah. We want to show this, and then we'll show you a, a real timbal of a real cicada. Okay. And then we'll do some questions. I promise. How did it work? Did it work? Ooh, oh, it darkened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, look at this. Do you remember the thing we put into the humidity chamber, the beetle? Yeah. So hold it up for them. Yeah. Okay. So it hasn't darkened all the. Ooh. It hasn't darkened all the way yet, but look at the look at the end of the or the top here up here on the thorax and the head section. The the bottom, the abdominal ends of the elytra haven't changed yet. But look how dark it has gotten. Look, we'll show you stick it under the scope. Because you can see also how it uh oh it's already lightening. 
So basically this animal changes with humidity. Yeah. And you can kind of see, at right least I can see on it. the side. Yes. That's a good, oh, yeah. that's a good part. So if we left this in the chamber for uh, a few hours, that section yeah. that's kind of turning greenish right in, there. in the yellow, that section, you are seeing it in, in process. Basically it's got a spongy layer inside mm -hmm. the exoskeleton and it absorbs water and it expands and hits the top of the exoskeleton. And this whole beetle in probably three hours, if we keep it in here mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll post a picture on yeah, yeah. social media, it will turn completely black. So as these animals go into a, a section of, of, of the forest or a section of over the environment, or if it rains very heavily with a lot of humidity, a lot of moisture, this animal's whole body will turn black. Yeah. It's not a color change. It's about absorbing moisture like yeah. a sponge. Yeah. And then the extra humidity, the extra water in the exoskeleton kind of changes the way the light comes in and, and bounces around inside that exoskeleton. And I want to say this, I don't really know the function of that, right? We know how the structure works and we know what's happening, but people are a little like the jury's out on what the function of mm -hmm. that is. Just because we don't know the function of something doesn't mean that A, it has no function or B, it, it has no worth. It has no worth. We as humans like to think about the world in terms of how does it benefit us or how does it harm us? But really the arthropod world functions in a different way. Yeah. Um, and, and we wanna really challenge you just because something is different, that doesn't make it bad. Just because something is behaving in a way that is not the way a human would behave, mm -hmm. that doesn't make it um, creepy or scary. Just because an animal has venom, that doesn't make it mean, mm -hmm. right? These animals are doing three things. They're trying to eat, mate, and make it through the day. And by make it through the day, I mean, they're trying to survive. Yeah. They're either hiding from a predator or they're- Or they are hunting for their own food. Exactly. Or they are defending territory or they're defending themselves from people like us, from yeah. us, okay? So these animals are, are doing these things in order to make it through the day. So when you look at them through the lens of, this animal is trying to survive. It makes things a little bit less scary and a little bit less like it's coming at me, yeah. right? It, it takes it takes um, the focus off of what could happen to us exactly. as humans and sort of opens it up more to how am I connected to nature in the same way these animals are connected to nature? Because we're all kind of like in this web of existence with each other. And you can get curious then. Instead yeah. of being like, oh, what is it doing? You can go, oh, that's cool. That's cool. What is it doing? All right. Now, Jessica, do you want to show that I do. Timble? Yeah, I, I just think it's really cool. And I'm going to go get our next animal. OK. OK. Uh, yes. OK. OK. Be right back. All right. Let me show this to you guys under the scope. Now, this is a specimen that we had and then it died um, on my back porch. So uh, we took the little wings off. Here are the little wing nubs where they were connected. And then this, are, this is the ribbed timble here. And these ribbed sections buckle. Um, they've got little muscles that sort of expand and contract. And then it creates this buzzing, snapping noise. Um, that we hear as the zzzz. and only the males make the noise. The males make the noise in order to um, attract females, actually. So if you are outside and you're hearing cicadas, you're hearing the males. Jessica! Jessica! I think I hear someone calling my name. So people, obviously we told you that we like to make costumes. 
this is our little cicada costume that we made. And I made one for you. Thank you for coming. Yes. As I told you, obviously I'm the male, right? I'm making that noise with mm -hmm. my timbals, okay? So let's go over the whole organism one more time. Yep. Head, start at the head. Abdomen, okay? So we're gonna start at the head. We're gonna give you, I'm gonna, yep. Get make, ready. Make you a little less human. And then we're gonna give you a Ooh. cybarium, which is the, the part that has the muscles that to suck through the rostrum. I'm gonna give you a little Ooh, rostrum. I love rostrums. Okay. Oh, we forgot eyes and antennae, which are very important. Eyes and antennae. There you go. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. Okay, and now you need. Yeah, I got legs. legs and wings. All right. Now that has to go underneath your rostrum. Because remember, we talked about how yep. the rostrum goes through the, the rostrum legs. sit. Huh. The rock. <laughs> the rostrum sits right here between the legs. So when you see a cicada, and just because you don't have food X near you or wherever you're tuning in, there are cicadas all over the East Coast. There's annual cicadas, and they have basically the same outline. They just have different colors, right? And so basically, you have eyes, little tiny antennae. You have this big cybarium. You have this big sort of like nose mouth part that goes down into the rostrum that lays in between the legs. Here's the legs, don't laugh. Look, the legs were difficult. Okay, and then we have the wings, right? The wings with these incredible wing veins. Remember, wings and legs always, always, always come from the thorax. And then of course we have the abdomen and on the cicadas, the really interesting thing about the abdomen is the males have those, I'm thrilled with that. Timbles, super thrilled. People, we made all of this with stuff that you can find in your house. We love to do that. If you have young kids at home, if you're young and you want to make a cicada costume, you want to make a costume that functions and that looks like the structure mm -hmm. of an animal, you'd be amazed. Toilet brushes can be mouth parts. I, little cups These are can little be Dixie eyes. Cups. Little twist ties headphones. Antennae, headphones, you just rubber bands. These are it. socks. This is a bib from a toddler, right? So there are ways for you to enjoy the natural world and get some creativity out, get your craft on, and you can learn a lot about how things function. Create yep. the function using using materials that you have. That's one of the ways that we love to do things oh, yeah. is how does that work? How does it, can we, can we mimic it? Yeah. And it gets your brain in a problem solving inquiry kind of mode anyway. It's, it's a nice complimentary process. All right. Right before we go and, and answer your questions, I know we're going over with time, but we just want you to see this fully because basically it's a, because basically it's amazing. This is what we're doing for Halloween, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, people, we're going to go back over into the other room and Heather's going to um, do some questions with us. All right, cool. All see right. you soon. We'll see you in a minute. Thank you so much for uh, sharing all of that with us, Christy and Jessica. That was amazing. I hope everyone who is with us today had a great time as well. Um, and feel free folks, if you have questions for Christy and Jess, throw those into the chat. Um, maybe you've seen cicadas around where you are, whether you're here in Minnesota or closer to where Christy and Jess are, um, okay. East Coast, whatever it might be. So make sure that you're letting us know what kinds of insects you've been seeing around your own homes too. Um, and while we wait for questions to come through, I have a question for you too. Yes. Um, so I am wondering if you have a favorite cicada. There are so many different species and you mentioned that not all cicadas are brood X, right? So we have a number of different types mm -hmm. of cicadas, and I'm wondering if you have favorites of your own. Yes. Yeah. Um, you, you know what? The big one from Peru. 
Oh my gosh, that uh, one was amazing. Uh, so we get to go to the Amazon rainforest um, in a normal year, mm -hmm. uh, like twice a year. And we get to bring teenagers to the Amazon rainforest, which is, it's our favorite week of the whole year. And we were out once and we kept hearing this thing, you know, at, at night in the rainforest, in the Amazon rainforest, it's like, it's so noisy. It's a, it's a symphony of bug noise. Mm -hmm. And the loudest thing is a cicada. You know, they, they can be almost as loud as a jet plane engine, depending on how far away from them you are. They are very, very incredibly mm -hmm. loud. And so um, I caught a cicada that was no joke. The body was this big and we were stunned. And I think that's one of the great things is like, obviously we love bugs, but, and we've seen a lot of different kinds of arthropods all over the world. But when you see something that, that where we are, I mean, we were squealing and, this, and it was so loud that we had to let it go almost immediately because yeah. it was too loud to be close yeah. to. Yeah, and after it left, your ears were ringing. Ringing. And everybody was like, it was, was amazing. It was incredible, <laughs> yeah. And we, yeah. That's so amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that story. Um, I'm gonna turn off my camera so everybody can see Christy and Jess big and front and center. And uh, we've got some questions coming in. So uh, Jack, who is age six, is wondering how big is the biggest bug? Jack, that is a great Ooh. question. It big is. is a hard thing to measure. Mm -hmm. Heaviest, largest uh, tall wise, largest and, length wise. And are we talking just insects or are we talking insects and arachnids? Oh uh, yeah. Are there other because, arthropods? Because there's really long centipedes. Yeah. There's really big leg spans of spiders. Yep. But you know, one of the things when people ask us this question, one of the things we love to show, because I think people are like, oh, spiders. Oh, yeah. centipedes. Oh, oh, moth. I, we've got a moth. Yep, it is one of the largest in the world. Hold on. Yep. So Christy's going to go get our specimen box and um, we have an atlas moth and the atlas moth, like Chris said, is the it's, it's the largest moth in the world. And its wingspan is just about at a foot. Well, I'm going to counter you on this. It's the tallest this way moth yes. in the world because there's a white witch moth that's, that's longer, longer this, way. this way. So it's it's a tricky thing when we're talking about measurements, Jack. But here yeah. is that atlas moth. And what they do, they have a really special thing where the tips of their wings look like a snake. Yep. So do you see these um, black spots right here up in the corners? And then there's a line that sort of tracks down along the edge of the wing. It is mimicking a, a snake in profile, right? If the snake's face was turned yeah. this way. So if I looked at it and saw that, I might think it's a snake and not a moth. Yeah, that is a great question, mm -hmm. Jack. We love those questions. Thank you. And thanks for showing us the Atlas moth too. That's such an amazing insect. It's so great to yeah. see. Yeah, we, we love um, this. We have another question in from Terry. Terry has been taking pictures of dragonflies mating and they are wondering how that works. Oh, Terry. That's a great question. Terry. Okay. The mating of dragonflies can get a little bit intense. Um, uh, basically, as you have seen dragonflies and damselflies mating, you've seen that they are connected, right? As they're flying, which is a feat in and of itself. Yeah, and not amazing. tail to tail, like no. a lot of other insects you see. Yeah, they, they, are, they are connected. So, so you'll have the abdomen hook into further up on the abdomen, mm -hmm. up near the thorax, yep. right? And so they kind of form a little circle. And I'll say this, um, in Japan, uh, dragonflies for, for eons have been revered. They're a very special insect in Japan. And there is some lore about um, Japan being called the Dragonfly Isles because the outlines of the islands looks like two dragonflies mating, which is a really beautiful, beautiful thing. We also teach a lot about cultural entomology. Mm -hmm. and we just love, we love to make those human connections as well. So, so um, I'll tell you this, and, and it might be a little bit intense, but, but I'll tell you this. Male dragonflies don't like competition with other male dragonflies. And so they have sort of a scoop on the end of their abdomen where they will scoop out 
um, reproductive material from another male. If a female has mated with another male, they'll scoop out the competing reproductive material in order to mate with that female and they will mate guard. So they will they will be highly uh, territorial mm -hmm. over the female that they have mated yep. with. And, and they'll they'll fight off any other male that comes. Yeah, them. absolutely. So dragonfly mating, dragonfly and damselfly mating yeah, yeah. is really intense and it's different between species. And so, you know, different species have evolved different techniques in order to make sure that their genes that the individual's mm -hmm. genes are the ones that go, yeah, that 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 go on to live. Yeah, great question, and we can talk a little bit more about that one. Maybe the audience is not so young. We could be intense. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah, it is super intense. <laughs> um, uh, we have another question in from Emma. What does a tarantula lay? Oh, Emma. Hmm. We can answer this in several ways. And actually, one of, we didn't get to talk about spider abdomens, spider opisthosoma, yep. which is the, the abdomen section of a, of a spider. True spiders, well, they lay eggs, but they also mm -hmm. lay silk. And you might not think of it that way, but that's the terminology. Yeah. And especially our tarantulas, um, Beyonce, our trencher, will lay silk. She's got two spinnerets at the back of her, well, she's got spinnerets at the back of her abdomen and they twist like this and she will touch them down to the ground and she will lay silk. And if we are lucky, I think I can pull silk out of Beyonce's abdomen live on camera and show you that she lays her silk in a sheet, sort of mm -hmm. like several strands. Are you interested in seeing that? Yeah, I've got it down here by our feet. Is anyone interested in seeing that? Because I can pull it out underneath the microscope for you and it's really, really cool. Um, but but tarantulas also uh, have an egg sac. So, th and th that is wrapped in silk as well. Yeah? Okay, so okay. here's this. Let me turn the microscope camera back on. No worries, I'll just grab her here. And by grab, I mean gently Res allow respectfully, her, respectfully allow her to get onto my hand. She's already laying silk. Okay. That's because she's very excited. So I've got Beyonce. One second. And Let me pull it this way. I am going to show you underneath the microscope. Oh, yeah, she did it. Oh, oh nice. Wow. Look at that. Look at I just that. pulled that out of her abdomen. When it is in her abdomen, it is liquid. And when it hits the air, it turns solid. I'll try to bring over near her. You her. It's coming you from there. Yeah, you can't see it quite as well. That's where it's coming. Yeah. Look at that. Nice. And then you've got these strands of silk. Now tarantulas don't make webs like like hanging webs. They lay their silk on the ground, kind mm -hmm. of like a tripwire, and also and also um, to like line their burrows and to create little like hammocks for themselves if they're an arboreal species. Yeah. Oh, that was cool. That was cool. Great question, Emma. We loved that. That was amazing. Thank you so much for showing us that. Yeah. And also thank you, Beyonce, for sharing your silk. Yes, I know, sharing her silk with us. She's so lovely. <laughs> um, so Christy, Jess, we are out of questions for the moment, but did you all have some other things that you wanted to share with anybody before we head out for the day? Yes, yes. actually. It's in our drafts already. Yeah. Heather, we have, we um, have, we're sending, um, well, I think she wants to share it in the chat. Do you want to share it in the chat, Heather? Yeah, we could share it in the chat. That'd great. Be great. So, uh, um, so we have an, uh, glossary of entomological terms. And I think Christy mentioned that earlier, um, in the talk, but we're also attaching, um, five outdoor exercises, uh, yes. that there it's all about inquiry and observation that you can do if you're looking for something to do outside that might be a lot of fun. So hold 
hold on one second. I'm just like gathering it for us. Yeah. Um, because otherwise I have to like download this. Hold on one second. In order to get it. Okay, here we gotcha. go. Here we go. Okay, people. Um, here we are. Okay. We have five outdoor exercises. And can I just mm -hmm. drag this into the chat for you? You're welcome, Emma. Did that work for you, Heather? I'm not seeing anything. I don't see that it came through. I'm dragging a PDF into the chat, but it's not working. Uh, go here and see. Oh, it goes to, oh no, we don't have the option we to don't share, have the option Heather. To share, Heather. So can we just email it quickly to you and then yeah. have you input it or would that be? Well, the other thing we'll do is we will email it out to everyone who registered. So they'll have oh, it in their inbox afterward too. Perfect. Uh, awesome. They can go back and access it if they lose the chat or something today. Yes. Too. I love it. And Lainey, we, we have a ton of stuff on our website. Yes, they're on our website. Um, the five exercises is not, so check out your email for that. Mm -hmm. But we have a ton of cool stuff on our yeah. website. Lots um, of videos, lots of awesome costumes. Lots of costumes <laughs> if you're if you're interested. I'm so glad that you enjoyed it. Thank you, Lainey. And we would if you make bug costumes please please show us because it's yeah. super fun it's one of our favorite things to do yeah and also like if you see an awesome arthropod outside and you want to share that also yeah let us see it that'd be we've, great we've got social media we're on um facebook uh twitter and instagram all at the bug chicks mm -hmm. and you can also ask us and if like if you're if after this you're like oh i want to ask a question we have a form on our website where you can ask us and we answer kid emails first because yeah. they're our favorite business emails to answer. So a blue butterfly, hold on, wait. Oh, here's one, here's one that she can use as inspiration. Lady, we're so excited. Check this out. Yes, so you wanna make a male blue morpho yep. butterfly costume and the males use this blue color to kind of fight dance with each other for territory they kind of flash that blue and they're like yo this is my plant and yep. then the other one's like this is my section of the forest and they use that blue though if you're going to make it morphologically correct it can only be blue on one side and then the other side has to have eye spots and be brown and blended boom. with the environment boom <laughs> Thank you so much, Terry. And you know, we try to we try to have a little something for everyone. Yeah. Um, uh, and we're so glad that you enjoyed this. Again, if you all have any questions, anything you want to 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 share or tell us, um, we would love to hear from you. And I'm glad that our love of bugs was translated even through this uh, this sort of remote summit. And um, yeah, we have a we yeah. have a super love of bugs. And honestly, we're probably gonna go put our costumes back on have lunch out on the patio with cicadas so i don't know what y'all are doing but that's what we're gonna do <laughs> thank you both so much this was so much fun and uh i can't wait to see if folks uh make their own insect costumes and share them on social media i hope you will do that um those of you who are in minnesota in the twin cities area please come see us at the bell museum check out Bugs Outside the Box. We will have it here until September 12th, so you still have time. Um, so come check it out. Check out all of the activities we have on the learning landscape. I just threw some links into the chat a little bit ago, and I will throw those all in there one more time for everyone, um, including links to the Bug Chicks website and our events page, as well as um, the specific registration pages for our next two uh, online programs. Um, so we've got the next one coming up will be July 22nd is uh, adult bugs trivia night. So grab your friends, uh, join us for that. We'll have a little cocktail hour in there as well. Um, and then we have another workshop coming up the, toward the end of July on the 29th with the Ramsey County Master Gardeners. They'll be teaching us how to take care of our gardens with um, 
pest control that is friendly to the environment and the, the bugs and insects we want to be there as well. Um, so check that out. And we've got a few more coming up throughout the summer and we hope to see you all around the bell soon. Thanks for being with us today and have a great rest of your Saturday, everyone.